Isabella, I don't know if you're listening to this or not, but I've made up my mind. This is the last resort. I'm going to end it all. I'm sorry that I got you involved in all of this. I love you, Isabella. Well, that doesn't sound good. I go back to the security room and ask my tasty Latinxa girlfriend what's going on, but after the immense amount of willpower I used to get through the prior day, I believe I've earned a nice and calm morning walk in the mall. Nightmare zombies and an overprotective brother-in-law be damned, my PP bar is still smaller than my phone. I need to get my cardiovascular system going if I'm going to impress Isabella on our wedding night. Jessie's invited to the honeymoon as well, so long as she wears the collar. Otis can tag along the film. I slide my slippery little body into Wonderland Plaza, hitting up the bookstore to grab a true crime book for Isabella. I know hoes love reading about violent rapes and murders for whatever reason, and I got my shoddy covered. I have a quick breakfast, eating my doctor's one and only weakness, and head on over to the nearby Sephora to get some clown makeup for the honeymoon. On baby, we gonna get that clussy after becoming unified in the eyes of the Lord. Within the makeup store lurks a man wearing overalls and sporting a nasty looking wound on the back of his neck. While he begins to smash the kneecaps of the nightmare zombies flooding the store, I realize that this man is paying no mind to what is going on. This betrays the fact that this man is clearly severely... <clears throat> mentally disabled. Alright, this guy is far more dumb than any of the previous survivors. I'll just lead this tar to the safe room and get some tasty tasty pee pee for my troubles. I unleash the fury of the red cyclone all over the faces of the zombies and catch poor simple Leroy in the process. To deal with simple Leroy's kind, one must establish dominance, so I pick up two zombies by the grundle and throw them so hard they break their necks, proving to simple Leroy that his tarred strength is nothing compared to my incel rage. I hypnotize him while he's having a minor breakdown with the flash of my camera, and that's enough to get the half-starved hamster in his brain to get moving and follow me. With simple Leroy in tow, I head out to the grocery store to grab some wine for the celebration party after the helicopter picks me up in the morning. All subscribers are invited, even you. Unfortunately, I came extremely close to death after being jumped by everyone in the store and had to drink a bottle, so BYOB to cover what I had used up. After grabbing what the urban youth call, drink, I head over to the gun store to grab more shotguns so that I can execute all of the survivors that have pissed me off from day one all the way up to moments before our chopper ride. Simple Leroy can catch up, he can smell the exhaust fumes from my motorcycle from miles away and track it like a bloodhound. I open up the doors of the gun store and... You know, I've been shot so many times in the last few days I hardly even feel it anymore. Inside the store are some preppers, including Soap McTavish from the Modern Warfare series. I try to convince them that I have an even better base than their closed off room with fermenting Cletus droppings in the corner, but the fumes have warped their brains hard enough to keep them from following me. Thankfully, they have the presence of mind to ask for some proof and will follow me to the security room once showed said proof. I could have shown them the rooms full of survivors, but none of them have a PP sticker. The only way to convince them is to show them a picture of the vent entrance. I agree to come back with their proof, take simple Leroy, and head on my way. I normally take a photo of the vent entrance at the start of every run and save it, but for this playthrough I was too preoccupied by the strange feeling that Otis might have been doing things to my unconscious body after he saved me from the entrance plaza. I think that sick fiend might have had me in chains and locked in the Paradise Plaza shortcut had two federal agents not shown up. Anyways, before heading on out to the security room, I pop into the hardware store to pick up Cliff's machete. I have an odd feeling I'll need it today. Before we can leave the North Plaza, simple Leroy has trouble with the concept of a waypoint and stands within a crowd of zombies. I toss a queen jar over at the crowd and the sound of screaming zombies and bursting chests cause sensory overload within simple Leroy's brain, giving him enough brain power to run back to the waypoint. While crossing through the park, I admire the second set of convicts' driving skills as I head into Paradise Plaza. Inside Paradise Plaza, our old buddy Carlito once again starts raving over the intercom. Simple Leroy once again gets overstimulated and begins to have a panic attack. I don't have time for this. I follow up on the Grendel grabbing threats and pick up Simple Leroy. 
The fun part about using this move on survivors is that you're essentially forcing the game to act as if you were carrying them on your back, giving you grab immunity. If this game would let you keep your normal walking speed, I'd use it during every survivor escort. Anyways, I ignore the soft and warm feeling of a full adult diaper in my hand as I haul this imbecile into the warehouse. I get through the warehouse and snap a quick photo of the vent to convince the preppers to come along with me. Simple Leroy lives to stick things up his urethra another day and I rest my legs within the security room. Inside the security room, Isabella starts going on about how Carlito's last resort, if he had been cornered, was a last minute conversion to Islam and everything that that brings. I don't see any issue, it's a religion of peace. Oh, right. Islam. Oh god, if he blows up Willamette, it'll cause Santa to become aware of the true culprit in the Keys family Christmas disaster, putting everyone in America on the naughty list and ruining Christmas 2006. We've got to stop him. Brad, pumped full of adrenaline at the thought of saving Christmas, heads into the maintenance tunnels beneath the mall in order to stop Carlito's plan and keep the Christ in Christmas. I'm going to help too, after saving the preppers. I'd leave them to die if they didn't have soap and a real cutie pie in there. I get back to the North Plaza and hand over the picture of a vent that could totally be any random vent in the mall to the ambassador of the hunting shack, successfully convincing him and the rest of the squad to come with me. I take them from the North Plaza and through the park and enter Paradise Plaza, running into Kent. Yeah, yeah, you can't take pictures of sexy babes like me, I get it. What are you gonna show me? Oh god, why is your pee pee bar on that man's face? It appears that the fact that sexy chicks will let me take photos of their breasts has blackpilled this ugly freak and he has turned into a femboy connoisseur as a result. Whatever man, just keep it away from me. Why do you have a gun pointed at me? After a quick fade to black, I find myself chained up in the fountain, feeling incredibly naked without my horse head and clothing. Kent, foaming at the mouth, takes pictures of the sexy bar man for his sick <laughs> games. He's gonna pay for violating me. The fight starts and the group of heavily armed preppers take the opportunity to shoot an annoying freak to death, long after he stole my clothes and chained me up. I know Alyssa was looking at me though. Call me after the boss fight, babe. Thankfully, I have these guys to damage Kent for me. When he ripped my head off, he also stole all of my weapons. Majority of the fight is just dodging zombies while the preppers do most of the damage to Kent. After a moment of realism where a group of armed lunatics successfully shoot a strange little chud to near death, game logic reasserts itself and demands I hit Kent with the final blow. Easier said than done. Even though I started the fight at full health and went for the final blow with a bowling ball, I still can't hit Kent. He's just too damn fast for me without the spirits of the horses guiding me. I get my health whittled down by Kent's jump kicks while the preppers, still high off of that nasty Cletus Jankum, hit me with friendly fire. I hit Kent over the head with a potted plant, somehow doing no damage to him, and get kicked through a bench, shattering my spine and killing me. <sighs> God damn it, I hate Kent so much. Back to my last save, I once again recruit the preppers, eating an entire block of cheese for courage and to use my lactose intolerance as a possible last resort against Kent. I prepare myself for the fight by grabbing shotguns for some reason. I don't remember why I did this. I was going to lose them after Kent jumps me and wouldn't make it to stop him before he dick slapped a survivor to death. The fight starts significantly worse the second time. It appears that the preppers are even more high on Cletus's supply and aim far worse as a result. On top of that, I lose health to the zombies, Kent's karate moves, and more friendly fire. I would give up and claim defeat, but Kent made a fatal mistake this time. He forgot to take my horse head off. Clothes, no clothes, it doesn't matter. I'm 100% myself and he cannot do anything to stop me. I get knocked down to one block of health. There's no time to heal and it's looking incredibly grim. Suddenly, I see the crowd of zombies sprinting towards me from the park. Remember how on day two, I was able to get a massive PP boost by taking a photo of the nightmare zombies? This saves me when I snap a photo of the crowd. The upskirt from the zombie on the right pushes enough blood to my PP to level me up, fully healing me. When I turn back to the fight, ready to defeat this black-pilled porn addict, I notice that the preppers did their job and he's one tap away from death. I then lose almost all of my health and almost die. This time I give up on trying to cave his skull in as promised on day one and lightly tap Kent in the nuts with my big toe, doing enough damage to put him down. Kent lies dying at the floor and asks me to take a photo of his dying moments. And I don't, I don't really feel like it. Kent fades from this world while looking at my pecs. While I escort the preppers to the security room, I ask them not to mention any of what they had seen to anyone inside. Thankfully, they're all still too high to really comprehend what had happened. I take advantage of this by giving soap a lead pipe, 
convincing him that it was a $20 weapon skin with pink laser tracer rounds and stealing his rifle from him. Not only is this assault rifle the first one you can get until later on in the day, it'll be a big help when I fight another psycho down the line. I head into Paradise Plaza to stop Carlito's bomb plot, but notice a woman wearing a problematic armband in a CD store. As the ravenous crowd of zombies screams at us from behind a thin pane of glass, I realize that it's in fact not the windmill of friendship, but instead she has the Japanese flag on her arm instead. Second best acts as power, but beating Italy in that contest is like winning the Special Olympics. I convince this weeb that Isabella is also a big fan of anime. She's interested in watching anime with a fellow otaku, but when she asks me what anime Isabella watches, I give up and just lift her over my head and take her to the security room. I don't know why, but I have a soft spot for majority of the Day 3 survivors. Maybe it's because the time isn't as tight to save them as the previous days, maybe it's because Simone here reminds me of my ex-girlfriend, I, I don't know. Anyways, rescuing Simone gives me another level up. I celebrate my new health block of health by doing a Frank West spin in front of Otis and take a quick nap before taking care of Carlito's bombs. This is where the ultimate challenge finally begins. The bombs are beneath the mall in the maintenance tunnels. Five bombs are scattered throughout the labyrinthine tunnels and between each bomb is an ocean of zombies. This is already a somewhat difficult task, made into a damn near impossible one because of the fact that these are nightmare zombies. There are a few vehicles in the tunnels that can make travel easy on me, but the amount of zombies just throwing themselves at the car will drain the car's durability with frightening speed. All of that makes things very difficult, yes, but the true cherry on top. The moment during the divorce where you realize your alcoholic wife is taking the kids with her tweaker boyfriend is Carlito and his truck Peace. Carlito patrols the tunnels after you grab two of the five bombs, mowing down the zombies in his truck and throwing pipe bombs, really committing to the whole Islam bit. Best part is that I could just grab all the bombs and complete the mission, but defeating Carlito here is a mandatory part of the challenge. I spend so much time trying different tactics to finish this fight. I enter the tunnels from Paradise Plaza in order to grab a car that spawns in the area so that it'll be easier to travel. Before I can get any real progress in, Carlito comes to stop me. I get out of my car to try and fight him, but it's incredibly difficult to get a single hit on him with a melee weapon before he either pulls away or gets surrounded by zombies, making him impossible to hit. This attempt kills me, and I start again. Second time, I took a machete and some untouchable juice before heading into the tunnels on a motorcycle from the parking lot. I do somewhat better this time, actually managing to hit Carlito enough times to make him flee, but his pipe bombs destroy my motorcycle, leaving me stranded in the tunnels. He once again springs an attack on me, and despite the crowd of zombies trying to stop me, I manage to defeat him. This is only a Pyrrhic victory, as I am now stranded in the tunnels with no time to get the bombs, and with a single block of health. A zombie bites me and ends this run. Next time I forego any prep to save time and try to use my Uzi and AR to try to kill him. The zombies block every shot like how they did for me in the Joe fight, and I end up as pavement pizza. Time and time again, I head into the tunnels only to be slaughtered. Time and time again, he takes his revenge for when I called him Latinx. Time and time again, the zombies rip me to shreds for being so sexy. If it's not Carlito, it's the zombies. If it's not the zombies, it's Carlito. If it's not Carlito, it's the zombies. If it's not the zombies, it's Carlito. If it's not the Carlito, it's the zombies. If it's not the zombies, it's Carlito. <sighs> Almost lost my cool there. If I'm going to overcome this, I'm going to need to play it smart and use all the luck I've got saved up. Once again, I enter the tunnels through Paradise Plaza. Instead of grabbing the bomb closest to me, I head over to the most remote bomb location beneath the North Plaza. Getting this out of the way will save me time before Carlito spawns in. After that, I head to the next bomb location underneath the entrance plaza and grab that bomb. With two bombs out of the picture, Carlito immediately spawns in and throws one piss missile of a pipe bomb at me. I pick my ass up off of the floor and head upstairs into the entrance plaza. I circle back into Paradise Plaza, quickly make an untouchable drink for when I actually confront Carlito, and head back into the tunnels. Alright, now I head down to the next bomb beneath the Alfresca Plaza. After I grab the bomb, Carlito's sixth sense kicks in, and he immediately comes to throw more bombs at me. As I drive over to the next truck, I ponder the origin of the pipe bombs. Where the hell did he get so many? Beneath the grocery store is another bomb truck and a drivable truck. I reach the next area, and not a moment too soon. 
Right as I get to the next bomb, my car finally dies on me. I thank it for its service and grab the fourth bomb out of five from the truck. Carlito is absolutely calling me the dreaded C word at this point, Cracker. But I ignore his racial slurs and calmly smash him in the head with a sledgehammer, knocking out a third of his health. As he pulls another pipe bomb out of his ass, I hit him one more time, scaring him off as the bomb turns my organs into a smoothie. Last bomb left. It's beneath Wonderland Plaza and conveniently close to the exit. I grab the bomb and chug the untouchable as Carlito pulls up, ready to finish this once and for all. I waste the majority of the untouchable's duration by getting stuck in the middle of crowds and getting juggled by Carlito's bomb combos. I manage to get up to Carlito and give him one good smack with the hammer, scaring him off once again. Alright, I'm gonna need these zombies gone if I'm gonna beat him. Luckily, a queen zombie was spawned nearby. I forcefully take the queen and lead the surrounding zombies into the Wonderland parking lot. Carlito comes back, using the truck of peace to smash part of the horde, and I break the jar, wiping out almost all of the surrounding zombies. It's just him and me now. I once again fracture his skull with my sledgehammer, and he blows me up with yet another bomb. As he runs off, I loudly yell out my vile intentions with his sister, and he immediately turns around. This was his fatal mistake. As he pulls another pipe bomb out of his ass, the fuse gets snagged on his anus, giving me a window of opportunity to jump over and smack him one more time, finally defeating the most difficult boss fight of this run. Carlito runs away from me and crashes into a wall while looking in fear at the free-spirited reverse centaur that had just defeated him. He flips his truck over and I head over to give him a piece of my mind for his antics and he escalates the situation by shooting at me. Brad shows up to defend me, telling me to get the bombs out of the tunnels while he goes after Carlito. What the hell was he doing while I was busy getting my shit pushed in with Carlito and the zombies? As Brad runs into the newly forming Silent Hill fog, I take a look at my map. Defeating Carlito will spawn you in the area the cutscene takes place in, rather than where he had actually defeated him. Why? Why must I be punished? I am but a simple incel gamer. I'm running out of time to both get the bombs out and head to a psychopath fight immediately after this. Luckily, I'm right next to Paradise Plaza's parking lot. I grab the freshly respawned car and drive like a bat out of hell. As long as the car doesn't break, I've got a great chance to make it to the exit with time to spare. We're down to seconds as I make it back to the exit of the tunnels. Unfortunately, Carlito blocked out the exit, and I can't get my car out. But, I use my Frank West powers of ingenuity to turn a shopping cart into a bomb transport cart. I sprint out of the tunnel, mere moments before they go off. Before we can conclude my dramatic encounter, I have a psychic vision of what's going on with Brad. He's locked again in yet another gunfight with Carlito, gloating over the fact that Christmas has been saved and that Carlito will be on the naughty list this year. Brad is snuck up on by a zombie, only to turn and kill it with one shot. Big Baby didn't turn on nightmare zombies like I did in SMH. This leaves Brad with one bullet left in his gun. He thinks back to the time he clutched a 1v1 in a game of hardcore search and destroy back in MW2 and falls back on those skills. His aim rings true and he mortally wounds Carlito, seemingly ending this terrorist plans for good. Brad unfortunately forgets that we're in normal mode, not hardcore. Carlito regenerates enough health to get off a knife attack, defeating Brad. Brad gets thrown into the dark tunnel, turning on a pen light to reveal a wall of zombies in front of him. I don't understand why he's worried. Just use the zombie ride skill and grab some orange juice later. He probably only lost like one or two blocks of health, come on. Back to the better of the Carlito kill squad, I manage to get the bombs out with mere seconds to run away before they go off. Thankfully, Carlito's many pipe bomb attacks have given me a massive resistance to explosive damage. I am merely tickled despite my proximity to the bombs. Now that we're safe, it's time to go back to the security room and celebrate with my concubines after I check up on Brad. I take a cool convertible from the parking lot and head back into the tunnels to find Brad. I find his light on the floor, picking it up and walking up to where I hear Brad's voice. He begs me to keep away, but my urge to take photos of somebody, no matter what they say, takes control. I find Brad covered in something red. I get a good look at him and see the giant plate of spaghetti he had spilled on his lap. He begs me not to tell Jesse that he had spilled his spaghetti and asks me to put him down. Chill Brad, it's just some Italian food. 
Finish it up so you can get back to full health and we'll get you a new pair of clothes before heading back to the security room. I laugh at Brad's silly antics, glad he's okay, and head off to the next adventure. Time is of the essence here. My next mission is moments away from expiring, and I absolutely cannot miss it as this is another psychopath fight. Not only do I have a minuscule amount of time to get there, but I have less than an in-game hour to finish off the boss, escort the survivors from the fight, and get back to my hoe and side hoe on time. Carlito has really put me in a tough position here, but at Isabella and mine's wedding, we'll laugh it off as a funny story while Carlito eats from the feeding tube inserted to his full body cast and shits into a colostomy bag. As I enter Wonderland Plaza from the tunnels, I begin to hallucinate an old woman on a soccer ball while I enter a woman's clothing store and encounter a deranged sub-4 male with a level 2 Norwood threatening two fine young honeys of a Molotov cocktail. He's got the right idea, as I also enjoy my meals flame roasted, but unfortunately, time constraints and PP requirements will keep us from enjoying some prime long pork together. Paul, upset that I won't let him cook these Stacys, begins to attack me. I start the fight by pulling out Soap's M4 and unloading directly into Paul's upper chest. He powers through the sucking chest wound and absconds from the store, summoning the undead to protect him. Paul's boss fight revolves around chasing this little punk while he tosses bombs behind him while he sprints away. Unfortunately for him, he hadn't accounted for a man with an acquired immunity to explosives coming to kick his ass. After laughing at my old woman hallucination, Paul and the zombies hit me with a wombo combo, blocking me from moving while being thrown into the air by his explosives. I retaliate by firing my M4 into him again and following up with my Uzi. Paul gets too big for his britches, tossing a pipe bomb, knocking himself onto the floor, and gets shot for standing up to me. It's then revealed that this fight didn't actually happen at all. What actually happened was that Paul tried to light a Molotov to attack me, tripped on some acetone on the floor, and set his balls on fire, hallucinating the fight to hide from the pain. I take pity on this new eunuch. He might not have lost his manhood in the jaws of a sexy female zombie, but I feel his pain. I show mercy to this poor little disgusting balding subhuman loser by extinguishing the fire on his nuts and offering to teach him the ways of the incel trap star if he comes with me. I head into the closet to recruit the chicks he had been threatening. I briefly mistake one of them for my ex and almost crush her head with my sledgehammer. I play it off as a practical joke and drink a gallon of OJ to ease the tension. Recruiting everyone in the store levels me up and unlocks my true equine potential, giving me the running speed of a wild Mustang. I'm going to need this speed. Otis pulls some real homie shit and lets me know that Jessie is in an emotionally vulnerable position and that I can use her trust in me to manipulate her. I know that the whims of the fairer sex are fickle, so I waste no time getting to the store. Except I do waste a bunch of time. I head to the pedo shortcut and take a dump while waiting for my squad to ready up in the bathroom. Just like the day before, the survivors are not going to be able to get in with the amount of zombies blocking the door. This time though, I'm prepared. I use my sledgehammer to clear the crowd. When that breaks, I whip out my clutched unarmed attack, the double lariat. Thank god this move kills all surrounding zombies in one hit. Thanks to my countless hours as a Zangief main, I am able to clear out the nearby undead with minimal issues. As everyone enters, I pick up my ex and throw her into the bathroom, smashing her head on a bathroom stall. Time is running out. I get them all into Paradise Plaza and leave a waypoint by the warehouse as I lead the nightmare zombies away from my crew. Unfortunately, they are too traumatized from what they had seen in the shortcut and break their pathfinding again. I threaten them with the harmless horde of zombies behind me and they make it to the warehouse in fear. Seconds left, I'm having flashbacks to the Cliff Trio. I would have made it to the elevator on time with the survivors, but a few zombies had watched one too many episodes of Street Fight UK and shanked this poor white man, stealing all of his three dollars. This kills any spare time I have left, and I have no choice but to leave these guys in the warehouse while I head into the security room to seduce Jesse. Hopefully they don't start slamming their heads on the floor in fear while I'm gone. I've got literal seconds to get to the goal after I leave the warehouse. If I stop for even a second, it's over. I have more flashbacks to the cliff ordeal yesterday, giving me enough rage-based energy to make it to the security room at the absolute last second. In the security room, Jessie is delighted by my arrival, smiling and doing a cute head tilt, ready for me to invite her into my ever-increasing harm. We are so fucking back you have no idea. Isabella, jealous of the attention I'm giving to Jesse, entices me to Carlito's hideout with promises of the massive stacks of Dogecoin and AMC stocks he has on his PC. Enticed by the money I can use to fund my own personal bunny ranch, I follow her. As I leave, I get an odd feeling that my hallucination in Wonderland Plaza has finally dissipated. Before we head to the hideout, I grab my survivors from the warehouse. 
They lucked out considering the circumstances. If only it had ended that well with my ex. After violently sobbing over my one-itis, I do a sick Frank West spin that levels me up and reminds me of a wrestling move that I saw one time that I'll use maybe once or twice in this run. I tell Isabella to take me to the hideout, and we're off. The trip to the hideout is mercifully easy. Isabella is aware of the fact that the zombies are only after me, so she simply leads me to the next area without stopping to freak out over a horde surrounding her. I head upstairs to grab some OJ for us to celebrate our newfound riches, and we head to the North Plaza. The hideout had been hidden next to the gun store the whole time. Who knew? I wonder if the screams from the Cletus fight kept those guys awake. In the hideout, Isabella tries to access the laptop while on all fours, trying to seduce me. I wasn't really ready for this as my fear of women comes back with a vengeance. I sit next to her and point out a cable hooked up to the PC in order to try and avoid the dreaded S-word before I'm ready. She mentions that Carlito set up a smart jam maker that was connected to the mall's Wi-Fi and is using up all of the bandwidth. Before I'm put on the spot to engage with my responsibilities as the man in the relationship, Jesse calls me and talks about some random crap she saw on the monitors. Thank you, Jesse. Perfect excuse to get out of here. Before I leave, I take a particularly dramatic photo of Isabella and head off to see what's going on with Jesse. Before leaving the North Plaza, I yet again raid the gun store for some shotguns and a pistol or two. I've never found too much use for pistols in this run, but Simone used her subconscious psychic ability to ask for a pistol just for her. While on the way to the security room, I get a call from Otis mentioning that the sexy chick I had rescued from the cult is asking for me. Oh god, I just dodged Isabella's advances. Now that babe is after my half-chewed bulge. I steal myself and meet up with Jesse, who shows me that Carlito's being dragged, kicking and screaming, into a butcher shop by a giant obese man. I make a vow to save my brother-in-law from this beast, but first I've got people to talk to in the security room. I meet with Simone, chug a gallon of OJ to impress her, and hand her a gat. I forgot why she asked for it, honestly, I think she wanted to talk about some anime shit or whatever, I don't know. Paul then calls me over and asks if I was serious about teaching him my ways. I tell him that I'm going to be busy for the next few years, but if he makes an appointment with my secretary, I can get him some lessons on how to be as awesome sauce as I am. As I'm doing this, Floyd shakes his head disapprovingly at me because I forgot to get him some stupid old man crap. Anyways, Paul is extremely happy to hear that I will teach him how to be a true Sigma Chad and hands me a bunch of Molotovs as a down payment. This will come in handy for the upcoming boss fight. Now onto the sexy babe's request. I kick open the door, knocking Sophie into the rest of the survivors. Game time. The babe is impressed with my epic Sigma skills and demands to become a part of my goon material. Before I can ask her what she means, she poses seductively. She gives me some material for all the armpit chads out there as I begin to shake violently, realizing what's going on. She continues to pose, giving me some S-tier goon material. If I had shown Kent these photos for the challenge, he would have shot himself on the spot. As I take the next photo, Cheryl looks at me and notices something that immediately kills the moon and stops before she starts taking her dress off. What, the horse head? I take a single step and realize the wet feeling in my underwear. Oh. Oh no, my, my nofap streak. Why? I sprint out of the security room, intensely sobbing as I had embarrassed myself in front of Cheryl and all of those people. I had involuntarily broken my three-day nofap streak and showed them weakness. I saw Bill's eyes, he was laughing. I vowed to take revenge on everyone in there. Nobody will be able to leave this mall and tell the world my shame. I take off, vowing revenge. Off to go blow off some steam by saving Carlito and proving myself as a better man than him. I head into the tunnels once again, using the Paradise Plaza entrance to grab the car and speed over to the butcher shop. On my way there, I ponder the logic of having a butcher shop in an underground maintenance area. I'm but a simple Sigma male gamer, not a butcher, but having a butcher shop in what is essentially a garage seems incredibly unsanitary. Whatever. I enter the butcher shop and meet the butcher. Oh. Oh, he's Chinese. Never, never mind. That explains the state of the shop. I try to convince him to give me Carlito, who he has strung up and prepared to carve up. He gets offended when I suggest using sewer oil to cook Carlito is a waste of meat and ignores me while getting ready to butcher Carlito. Nobody puts baby in a corner. I engage him in a fight by throwing a Molotov at him, knocking off a sliver of health. Shit, Paul must have given me the diluted stuff. 
He picks up a cow carcass and tries to throw it at me, but I take cover behind the other carcasses and avoid damage. I throw another Molotov at him, but miss like a chump. He commits again to the cow toss. I understand sticking to a gimmick, but there's a point where you gotta give up and use actual useful tactics. Larry gets mad when another cow toss misses and reveals himself to be a Dead by Daylight player. This is proof that he needs to die. I escape his clutches and attack, taking advantage of his AI trying to throw knives at me while I hide behind a carcass and whittle his self down with my shotgun. I hit him with a heavy swipe from a butcher's knife and he finds the irony of it so funny he starts laughing and crying and pissing and shitting and cumming himself on the floor. As Larry is having his episode on the floor, I approach Carlito and tell him that it's over and that Willamette has fallen. Carlito asks about Isabella and I tell him that she's my fiance and that his schemes to keep us apart are over. Carlito starts talking about Santa again and I pretend to listen while I think about Larry's idea to cut up Carlito. Frying him in gutter oil with the side of cooked rocks would be a horrible waste of meat. As Carlito rambles, I think about making some Carlito carnitas tacos, either that or some El Pastor out of him. I think about the possibility of recipes on his computer. He needed funds to enact his schemes, and thanks to Breaking Bad, I know that criminals use mom and pop fast food joints in order to fund their enterprises. I begin to pressure Carlito about his computer's password, where the recipes for crazy Carlito's tacos are being held. The life is slowly draining from his eyes, but damn it, I will have that computer cracked. Carlito says something ominous about this not being over, and starts crying because of that Emperor's new groove character again. What a freak. When I hear the sound of a post-mortem bowel movement, I know that Carlito's gone for good. I take the necklace off of the meat, and grab Larry's comedically large cleaver from the floor and head back into the hideout. And by back to the hideout, I mean head to the grocery store to grab a bottle of wine. Earlier in the day, Floyd had requested a bottle of wine for some reason. I don't know why, I don't care anymore. I grab a bottle of Willamette's worst wine and head over. If I had time, I'd poison these ungrateful subhumans. Luckily for them, I have to go show Isabella her cool new piece of jewelry that I absolutely did not loot off of her brother's corpse. In the safe room, I hand Floyd a bottle of Vietnamese snake wine as he rambles on about some more old man bullshit. Just wrap it up, I can feel everybody's eyes on me judging me. They're all laughing at me. The violent urges are just barely repressed thanks to the PP boost fulfilling Floyd's final request. I quickly tell Jesse not to listen to anything the survivors say about me before running back to Isabella. I just need Jesse out of the security room for a few minutes. Enough to take care of everybody in there and blame it on the zombies. She's a woman. She won't think too deeply into things if I tell her that a nightmare zombie broke in and killed everyone. I return to the hideout. Isabella's red eyes betray the fact that she had been smoking some mad aloud while I was gone. I look at her with the infamous Frank West disappointment stare and she turns away, ashamed of her drug addict ways. Despite the fact she's a ram through weed hoe, I give her the gift I had stolen from her brother's corpse. This act of kindness reminds her of the true meaning of Christmas. Not gifts that can be easily stolen by zombie wasps, but the love of your partner even though you're a disgusting weed addict who deserves to be on the streets. She opens the locket, revealing Carlito's one true love. The love that she doesn't deserve and the warm voice of John Goodman remind her of the password to Carlito's computer. She turns off the jam maker and the mall's Wi-Fi immediately improves. As soon as the Wi-Fi signal improves, Jesse gives me a call and tells me that she can reach DHS HQ and call in the cavalry. Shit, this gives me no time to get to her and get her out of there before I silence the survivors. As I'm stuffing my underwear full of loaded shotguns, I get a call from Jesse informing me that the government is going to ignore everything happening here and send in a cleanup crew to liquidate everybody. Well, 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 for once the government is actually helpful for once. They've stopped molesting children and drinking their blood in order to help the little man silence his enemies. Man, I think I might actually vote this year. I psychically sense that Jesse curls up into a ball as I begin cheering over the phone. This is absolutely great. All I have to do now is take Jesse to the hideout with Isabella and hide from the incoming Black Ops kill squad until noon tomorrow. The fear of being alone with two women has completely left me. I skip joyously through the nightmare zombies as if they were nothing more than flowers in a breezy meadow as I go to pick up my hoe. When I reach the rooftop, I hear the government's operation starting and call Jesse to see if the security room is clear. Jesse? No answer, I'm, I'm sure she's fine. I enter the security room and... Oh. Oh no, Jessie's... She's gone, man. 
I swallow hard because I know that what comes next will hurt you more than me. I've covered wars, you know. I bite no! my lip to try to stop it from shaking the teeth that broke in the skin. And the blood tastes cool to me. After all, those nights you kept me warm. I'd hold my breath just to hear you sleep. I must admit, I saw it coming. The air between us had gotten harder yet to breathe. I'd run away. I can help it, but I can't remember to forget your face. No, making a joke about putting my meat into her mouth won't cheer me up. My Aryan queen, gone. I take an upskirt shot of her for one last goodbye, and man, I just, I just need a bit of, just need a bit of the sleep. As I lie down in despair, crying over losing Capcom's sexiest harlot, we cut to the entrance plaza. Several cutscene zombies are just sitting there, mad chilling, when suddenly gunfire erupts, dropping all of the surrounding zombies. It appears that the government has recruited the help of the Umbrella Security Service to quell the outbreak. I manage to get my shit together and get moving back to the surviving member of my harm. This part of the game has absolutely no survivors, no psychopaths, no main quest. From here until noon, I'm free to do whatever. The only caveat is that the mall is now filled with black ops soldiers that will attack me on sight. They're resistant to gunfire and can deal some heavy damage with their assault rifles. I head into Wonderland Plaza, grabbing another true crime book in order to forget my tragedy. I'm followed into the bookstore by two soldiers who will have a hard time hitting me with the 50 zombies who have sprinted in before them. I hit one with the grundle grab and then start dry humping a zombie in my extreme grief. I blow off the soldier's arm with a shotgun so that he can never tell anyone what I did in front of him. Despite the fact I'm only level 38 and this close to the end of the run, I don't sweat it too hard. Killing a soldier grants me 5000 pp and these guys respawn endlessly. I head into the grocery store so I can take a quick shortcut to the butcher shop and run into a bunch of the hunk wannabes. The congregation of soldiers here will make it a great place to get the blood rushing in my PP later on. Right now I'm going to be focusing on surviving. Since they're resistant to gunfire, melee weapons are going to be my best bet. Larry's cleaver and Cliff's machete will make killing these knuckleheads much easier. On top of the crazy damage, the true crime book I'm holding is whispering secrets on how to keep bladed weapons for longer periods of time. Now you may be asking, Mr. Unnamed Narrator, why not use the mannequin torso you love so dearly? If I could, I'd pat you on the head and laugh warmly as I explain that while the torso would likely one or two shot the soldiers, any surrounding zombies would get between me and the enemy and block the hit. Using a powerful blade like the machete will cut through both zombies and humans that stand in front of me. Then I'd begin to playfully chase you through my tomato garden, slowing down in a coughing fit and pass on from this world on a beautiful summer afternoon while you run, unaware of my passing, and beaming with joy before it all comes crashing down. I return to Isabella and we listen to the romantic sounds of automatic gunfire from the government death squad surrounding us. She starts talking about Santa again while giving me bedroom eyes. Damn it, I don't care about you or your Christmas obsession, you dumb bitch, leave me alone. I run out again, wondering about how long I can keep us from being alone with each other until I'm ready for the S word. I grab a book about cooking from Wonderland Plaza as I think about how to get over my fear of intimacy. I wander into the food court and from there run into some spec ops guys. I kill both of them with my cleaver. This puts me in the mood for some pizza. Between me and the nearby Sbarro are like six of the black ops dudes. Despite the countless rounds I'm riddled with, I take them all out with my cleaver and hop on behind the counter. I make a bunch of pizza which draws in all of the nearby zombies in order to get a taste of Frank's spicy sausage pizza. I taunt them by eating an entire pizza in front of them in two bites and mow them down with an assault rifle I had picked off of one of the dead soldiers. 
If you want the recipe for Frank's Spicy Sausage and Carlito Carnitas, look forward to the Come Dungeon Gaming Cookie stream when we reach 100,000 subscribers. There you will learn our family recipes passed down from generation to generation of sick freak incels. Next up for my goodbye to work the mall is the entrance plaza. I think meeting Hunk would be really cool, and I'm pretty sure the US has set up their base of operations there. In the entrance plaza, I'm disappointed to only find people cosplaying as Hunk. The area I'm in triggers a PTSD episode because of the horrible shame and pain I had to endure thanks to Shotgun Larry on day one. I black out and wake up surrounded by dead Hunk cosplayers in a raging full PP bar. I calm myself down by eating some salt and vinegar chips and pick up some light reading from a nearby bookstore. While I'm out and about, I pick up some shoes from Paradise Plaza so that I'll draw less attention of my crunchy, stinky, sexy toes from both the zombies and the thralls of the military industrial complex. After that is another run to grab a cleaver. Once I exit the tunnels and enter the grocery store, I hold off on PP joking in the grocery store with the soldiers and jump through a solid glass window. I pick up another machete from the hardwood store and head into the empty store next door where the cliff tree I had been held captive. Inside, I grab a book on the floor about survival. Okay, it's time to come clean. I got these books in order to increase the healing I get from food. This wasn't a farewell trip to the mall and the nightmare zombies. I just wanted to be able to enjoy the rich flavors of food I find off of the floor better. I hope you can forgive me. I head back to the hideout in shame for lying to my viewers and take a nap of shame whilst completely ignoring Isabella. As I sleep, I once again have a nightmare of the endless void of shame while I hear the echoing laughter of everyone who had watched me do something embarrassing, including creaming my underwear during a sexy photo shoot. I received yet another psychic premonition from the entrance plaza. The soldiers have seemed to finish their cleanup, seeing as how all of the surrounding zombies are now lying dead on the floor. The lead hunk cosplayer breaks character by taking off his mask and breathing in the smells of rotten flesh and gunpowder. The shock from realizing that this operation is being led by Hank Schrader from Breaking Bad shocks me out of my slumber, now with three extra PP levels and a sword in my underwear. This is a gift from the void, not the result of an uninteresting trip to the movie theater that I didn't bother writing about. It's just about time to head to the helipad. I ask my fiance if she wants to come along, but she refuses. Whatever. I know she'll be there at the last second. She can't resist my mysterious ways. I leave the hideout and... I hear nothing. No gunfire, no moans from the nightmare zombies. It's quiet. Peaceful. The military's operation was a success. Let's just enjoy this moment of peace. At the end of my casual stroll, I end up in the security room. I noticed a note on the desk where Jessie had put her heavy breasts and wistfully read the note as I remember her titties. Otis left this note and details how he escaped while the government was executing my enemies. If I had read this two hours ago, I would have vowed revenge on Otis for his cowardice, but I have made peace with the annoying old man. He did leave me to survivors that helped me grow my PP to a respectable size after all. Well, I'm at the helipad. It's noon. Or the hell's my pilot? Did he abandon me because of the PP jokes? Suddenly, I hear the rotor of a chopper spin up nearby. It is my pilot. He made it. While he celebrates the obvious transformation into the person he sensed I truly was, he is suddenly attacked by one of the nightmare zombies who had used their flying abilities to fly into the chopper and kill my pilot, preventing my means of escape. The zombie takes control and crashes the chopper into the mall. My spirit is broken. The West has truly fallen. I fall to my knees and accept death as the zombies begin to enter the area. 
They take their time walking up to me. They know they don't need a sprint to get me. Old Frank West is washed up and over. Or so they had thought. Isabella came to my rescue. I knew she was going to come back to me. While she domed some nearby zombies, I succumb to my despair and pass out. I wake up to the nasty ass, funky ass smell of the hideout again, finding my hoe waiting next to me. Isabella looks grimly at me. I hope she didn't look at my underwear while I was unconscious. Instead of leaving me because of the fact the zombie made me half of a man, she tells me that I have been infected with the zombie plague. Yeah, it, it really is over. The West has fallen for the final time. I don't care if Mom would be sad. We would need a miracle to save me now. As I begin to have a mental breakdown over my impending doom, Isabella sobers up enough to come up with an idea. Barnaby used Christmas magic to create the first generation of the wasps. If we can manage to get enough queens in the materials to extract the holiday magic from them, she can manage to force a Christmas miracle to save me. We are so back. I get up and ready myself to enter the mall again to save Christmas and myself. It's still quiet in the North Plaza, but suddenly a drone comes into view. It appears some asshole TikTokers have gotten word about the Willamont outbreak and have come to steal my story. I'll be damned if I let some Zoomers steal the Frank Westpin for their own degenerate dances. The drones are set to start playing obnoxious TikTok songs if I'm spotted by them, alerting every single Spec Ops dude nearby. On top of that, it's armed with an airsoft gun to annoy the shit out of me if it gets close enough. I shoot the first of many down and get snuck up on by a Spec Ops guy from a nearby store. This is the first headache of a number of increasingly more and more annoying headaches. This is the beginning of overtime mode. On this day, there are no survivors or any real quests to do. It's a challenge to test the skills that you have learned throughout the last three days. The mall is full of soldiers that will quickly wipe out your health, and you have only a day to collect the myriad of items Isabella needs for the Christmas miracle. You're going to need to use all of the weapons, shortcuts, and knowledge you've gained in the last three days if you're going to survive. One minor benefit is that zombies don't spawn in majority of the map for the time being. Normally I speed through this generally uneventful day with no issues, however the challenge presents, well, a challenge. I'm currently at level 43. As previously stated, I need to reach level 50 in order to consider the challenge completed. With no survivors to escort or psychopaths to defeat until later, the only means of raising my PP to the legendary 5 mark on my ruler is to mercilessly execute US servicemen. Just another Friday night for me. I begin this trial by running to the grocery store. As previously mentioned, the military has a strong presence within the store. It appears that they're trying to raid the cereal aisle in order to discover why kids love the taste of Cinnamon Toast Crunch. You fools, only kids can see why they love the taste of Cinnamon Toast Crunch, and I'm a child at heart. I masterfully eliminate the enemy, eat a giant red gummy bear, and struggle to decide what type of wine I want to carry in my underwear. I'm going to need all of the healing I can get, and with all three health books, one bottle of wine will fully heal me. With my alcoholism justified, I head on over to a jewelry store within Wonderland Plaza. Isabella is going to need to see the minuscule amounts of Christmas magic within the wasps in order to draw it out. I grab a pair of magnifying glasses while butchering a man with a wife and kids at home so that she'll be able to do this. As I leave Wonderland Plaza, I notice a soldier get embarrassed because he had been spotted within the Sephora there. I murder his platonic partner and toss him over my head. Picking these guys up by the balls and throwing them onto the ground really hard instantly kills them, so I'll be abusing this move and another I have yet to unlock in order to save weapon durability. After the antics within Wonderland Plaza, I hit up the Starbucks at the food court. At the Starbucks, I grab a blender so that Isabella can blend together enough Christmas magic into some eggnog so that I can ingest it better. When I leave the food court, I make a pit stop within the hardware store to pick up a chainsaw left on the floor. I give the soldier within the store a horror movie moment as I evade his sight while all he can hear is the sound of a running power tool that will be used in a most violent manner. I jump scare the audience watching his video when I pop up behind him and put his insides outside with my weapon. Also, it's not the smallest chainsaw so it doesn't count. I try the Leatherface routine on two other soldiers. While I get one of them, the other shoots the chainsaw out of my hands. I respond by trying to kill him with my bare hands before I give up and hit him with a cleaver. I start getting the shivers when I notice that some zombies have spawned in. I realize that this is likely a hallucination and go about my day as the zombies aren't supposed to be back within the main mall for some time. The lights go off when I reach the entrance plaza. Good, the darkness will give me cover to sneak up on soldiers. 
I change into a new pair of shoes, murdering the poor soul within the store and pop out from a nearby pillar, scaring the hell out of his friend before I murder him. Within a nearby sporting goods store, I grab a camp stove so that Isabella can simulate the environment of chestnuts being roasted on an open fire in order to concentrate the Christmas magic. Before I leave the entrance plaza for greener pastures, I bully a soldier by turning him into a nightmare zombie for a brief moment before killing him and his squad mate. A commenter on the last video mentioned the idea of Nightmare Special Forces. I'm not sure if it's possible, but this running dude's the closest we're gonna get until the gods of Dead Rising decide to torment me further. Next up, we're going to grab something from Paradise Plaza. I use a skateboard that I had picked up off screen to fight the power and knock over a soldier before I massacre him and his friends. After the murders, I eat a pie and make some quick step for the lulls. This other sporting goods has cold spray, perfect for simulating the chilly conditions of the magic's birthplace, the North Pole. Hopefully, the simulation will be acceptable to the Christmas magic, so that the dark ritual in order to bring about the miracle can begin. Alright, up next I'll need... Boob Sweat of an Elf. Uh, I don't know where I'm going to get that within a Colorado mall in the middle of September. Suddenly, I remember Jessie's huge heaving milkers and remember that she was yelling at me over the speakers during the bomb threat, likely sweating profusely due to stress. She was a sexy blonde woman with big boobs and elves are generally portrayed that way in my Japanese animes. Maybe the Christmas magic will get its sick kicks if I substitute Jessie's boob sweat in the recipe. I head over to the security room and check the desk. I pass a perception check, noticing the telltale drops of sweat over some discarded coffee filters and grab them. They smell like Jessie's perfume alright. This might be enough to save me. Thank you, my Aryan queen. The smell of Jessie's perfume reminds me that I need to pick up some gingerbread scented perfume for the Christmas miracle, so I make a particularly uneventful run to grab the perfume inside of the entrance plaza. Hunting down all of these soldiers has awakened something primal in me. I feel as if I can truly tear a man apart with my bare hands. I've seen the zombies do it to me anyway, so I know that the human body is definitely capable of doing that. This knowledge plays a Yakuza-esque cutscene within my brain in which I mimic the power of the nightmare zombies and learn the disembowel move. The cutscene was so cool you should have seen it. Shame it was only in my head and an angel told me that I couldn't show it to anyone. I try out my favorite skill on the same soldier in the hardware store, seemingly resurrected. This move is a one-hit kill on all soldiers while giving me invincibility during the animation, making this much more useful than the throw I've been using. My bloodlust rises and the quest for a Christmas miracle is on hold. I must kill. I get my happy butt over to the grocery store. All those soldiers in an enclosed space? Hmm. Alright, store's empty now. I take a breather and pick up an entire frozen salmon. Why? Don't question my decisions. It's my poorly made YouTube challenge run. After a trip to the butcher shop, I ready my pristine new cleaver, clear out the store yet again, and once more raid the pharmacy for any drugs that I can sell on the street that I had originally missed on day two. An overweight hood hustler once said, The thing about us wise guys, the hustle never ends. I cringe at my bad Tony Soprano impression, and run over to the hardware store, thinking that maybe fighting the soldiers in there will help me forget the cringe I just put out into the world. Inside of the hardware store, I bully some more soldiers, doing my sick unarmed moves and instantly killing them. After turning another one into a nightmare zombie, the surviving soldiers have enough and riddle me with bullets. This wipes out my health, but due to the heroic doses of bullets I've taken over the last few days, I'm only knocked out. The Spec Ops crew take this opportunity to capture me. 
I wake up in their chopper, tied up and stripped of my horse head. I need to escape this horrible place and get my head back on. I begin to have an autistic episode in order to break the restraints on me. I have to do this silently. If I'm spotted trying to escape by the soldiers, they'll knock me out and I'll have to restart my escape after losing several hours of time. Thankfully, my tarred rage raises my body heat to such a high temperature that I melt the plastic binding me and I'm free. I kill the soldiers off screen and wind up in the park. I'm given a warm welcome by the nightmare zombies as they sprint towards me so that they can tear the head I was born with off. There's no time for that. I have to be right. I have to be whole. I pick up a random back scratcher off of the floor and head into Paradise Plaza. My only weapon does poor damage to the soldiers, taking several hits to knock one down. Great. I finally reach the children's clothing store and finally make myself whole again. The soldiers were definitely not expecting some sort of horse minotaur creature to jump out at them and cut them up with a knife. I have a moment of introspection as I'm severing a spec op guy's neck. I'm running around, taking massive amounts of damage I shouldn't be able to survive, avoiding capture and scaring the shit out of my victims before I killed them. Have I become a psychopath? Of the boss that a John Call of Duty will come to defeat? No matter, there's no other main character here but me. I run around the mall again, picking up a sweet pair of sunglasses, the food books, and a cleaver before heading back to the hideout to deliver the components for the Christmas ritual to Isabella. She reveals that since people just don't believe in Santa like they used to, the ritual isn't perfect and that the miracle that it will bestow onto me will only be temporary. I mentioned that I'm essentially a time bomb and that jogs Isabella's memory. She reveals that Carlito had blown all of his dogecoin in AMC in order to fund not just Crazy Carlito's taco stand, but an orphanage as well. They had used the Christmas ritual to grant the wishes of 50 orphans, but there was a catch. Carlito would silently wish for the children to be infected during the ritual, giving them parents, but infecting them with the wasp at the same time. Perverting Christmas and ruining it for America. It's possible that nightmare zombies are currently running amok throughout the country as we speak. This is horrifying. I start to do the Frank West spin out of fear as the power goes out, preventing us from doing the ritual. Isabella mentions that the park's clock tower has a spare generator that we can use. I ignore the horrible idea of using a generator indoors and head out to the park. When I had mentioned that there were no psychopaths in overtime mode, I was kind of sort of wrong. After the power goes out, a black hawk begins to patrol the park, being a worse threat than the convicts ever were. When you defeat the chopper, it's referred to as military, not a psychopath. Despite this, it's still a boss and I'm still gonna fight it. I load up on every firearm within the gun store, steal a rifle from a soldier, and head into the park. It looks like my pilot had crashed the chopper in the park and had smashed a hole within the base of the clock tower. This hole reveals a tunnel that is absolutely swarming with zombies. Maybe this is how the zombies have respawned back in the mall. I kick a zombie back into the zombie hole for having the audacity to step up to me and make a mental note for later before facing the chopper. The fight begins. I dodge the oncoming wave of zombies and jump up on top of the park's picnic area, giving both me and the chopper a clear shot to each other. I ready myself for the fight. This fight always takes me forever. It always feels like I'm actually trying to fight a helicopter with a FUD's hunting rifle. I hit the chopper with some sniper rounds, taking a burst of rounds to my chest. I pick the bullets out of my chest hair and ready myself for the chopper's next strafe. I hit it again with some hunting rifle rounds. I dodge another gunfire strafe and ready my assault rifle. I blast it a few times, not even sure I- Wait, wait, I killed it? it it's flying off? I look around in confusion, shrug, and drop most of my weapons, moving onward while remaining significantly confused. After the fight, I make yet another run through the mall, picking up all of the books and weapons that I had left behind when over-preparing for the chopper fight. After gaining my loot again, I head back to the hideout to give the generator to Isabella, only to notice I had left it in the park. God damn it, why must this world be so cruel to a sensitive soul such as mine? I head out to the park and grab the generator. The chopper has respawned again, but as with the convicts, we're considering respawning bosses defeated after finishing them off once. I grab the generator from the tower. This reminds me of the soulless survivor mains I've encountered within Dead by Daylight. I shudder to think of the sick minds that play that game and head back into the North Plaza. I realize that my antics over the course of the night have brought me up to level 49. Thank god this nightmare is almost through. I decide to grow my pee, pee to the screams of multiple soldiers, clearing out the hardware store and grocery store to bring me just a hair before bursting out of my underwear. Isabella gets her generator and lets me know that we're in the home stretch. 
All she needs now are 10 queen wasps to extract Christmas magic from and temporarily save me. I had a few on me already. I kept them there because their angry buzzing felt good when storing them in the front of my underwear. Just ignore the, say, fingerprints. Yeah, those are fingerprints on the jars, okay? I've reached the part of overtime mode where zombies begin to respawn in the mall, and quite frankly, I've missed them. It was getting rather boring not being slammed to the floor and chewed on multiple times within an hour. I've got to wander the mall now, killing queen zombies and stashing enough wasps right next to my privates in order to gather all of the Christmas magic I can. I gather a few queens here and there, making decent time. However, it turns out that it's that time of the month for me. Inside of the Alfresco Plaza, I'm subtly doubled over in pain thanks to my sperm cramps. Damn it, I plan to be out of the mall before my man period started. I run through the insane amount of zombies in the area, trying my damnedest not to get captured by the special forces again. I avoid hitting them because I want my final level up on this run to be a cool picture of the nightmare zombies. Unfortunately, much like a small European girl surrounded by a group of Somalian refugees, what I want ultimately doesn't matter. I have to use my final level up in self-defense. I kill a soldier and gain enough PP to put me at level 50. It heals me fully, but I cry silently, knowing that my special time has been ruined by these black-clad monsters. At level 50, you unlock the Zombie Walk ability, giving you the power to channel the parasite in your brain and temporarily mimic a zombie. This would make the zombies in the normal run ignore you, but these are the nightmare zombies. I put myself in a safe space and test out the move, only to be smacked by a zombie for my insensitive depiction of their kind. Anyways, I spend the next 10 minutes fighting off sperm cramps and gather enough queens for the ritual. It's just a ritual used to invoke the Christmas spirit. What's the worst that could happen, right? Well, once we gathered enough Christmas magic, the Christmas spirit entered the hideout. Draped in the faded memories of Christmas's long past and wearing the face of my mother, he accepted the magic we had gathered, but at a cost. A syringe full of a mysterious blue liquid appeared in Isabella's hands, and then the spirit turned to me, pointing a bony finger. Four. It croaked, in a voice only heard within the minds of madmen. The lights cut out, and the spirit disappeared. I'm only showing you b-roll right now, because I was too busy shitting myself to turn on my recording software. Anyways, with the ritual complete, and its consequences being pushed out of my conscious mind, we finally have my temporary cure. Isabella becomes the first one to stick something within the other in this relationship, giving me enough time to get the hell out of Willamette and figure out what we're going to do for my next dosage. She mentions that her soul has been cursed for this ritual, and that zombies will now be forced away from her, recognizing that she has become some new form of life that is even below them. I realize that we can use this to my advantage within the cave behind the clock tower. I let her know of this possible exit, and we're off. At the tower, Isabella begins having second thoughts. I have not come this far to come under the whims of the Latinxa mind. I tell her she's going in that cave, or else I'll show her something even more terrifying than the Christmas spirit. She begrudgingly agrees, and we enter the tunnel. The zombies spot us and begin to sprint directly towards us. Thankfully, Isabella's cursed aura causes the zombies to be violently pushed away from us. I readjust my junk, and this saves my game. Isabella and I have to reach the end of this tunnel to finally get the hell out of here. We come across our first obstacle, a gate blocking our exit. I use her to crawl through a nearby tunnel like a rat in order to come out the other side and open up the gate for me. I probably should have stocked up on machetes and swords before we left. Isabella opens the gate for the zombie flood to crash onto me. My double lariat skill keeps me above the waves, but just barely. I do not want to die and have to do this shit all over again. I reach Isabella, getting deep enough in her cursed aura to protect myself from the horde. The double lariat really comes in clutch here. We pass through an eye in this hurricane of undead shit and manage to get us both through it. We reach a door and jump headfirst into another horde behind it. I clear out the area as best I can, using my last queen to finish off the surrounding zombies so that we can pass to the next wall. Exhaustion hits as I put Isabella in the zombie hole and get dogpiled by zombies. I am lucky to find some queens within the horde. They give me just enough breathing room to reach Isabella and grab her hand. Her sickening aura envelops us, barely keeping back the next wave of this undead ocean away from us. We finally see the end of the tunnel. It's guarded by special forces and blocked by a wall and a horde of zombies. But we see a mechanism that could open the gates and let us hijack the military's Humvee. 
either that or flood the tunnels. I honestly just don't care anymore. This is too fucking much. I give up on trying to hold my cursed fiance's hand and just give her a piggyback ride, making the significant easier. Having her on my back not only prevents grabs, but the curse makes it so that zombies can't swipe at me and knock her off of my back. I really should have done this earlier. We reach the lever with no problem, releasing the zombies onto the spec up guys behind us and leaving the Humvee for us to take. We're home free! I think. I have no idea where we are, but this has got to lead us somewhere, right? God, please just get me out of Willamette. We end up in an obvious final boss arena, instead of the refreshing hot spring I was hoping for, and end up getting jumped by a fucking tank of all things. I briefly relinquish control of Frank West and take control of Isabella. I can hardly think with the voices in her head whispering tales of doom in the coming years as I engage the tank. The tank fight is something completely different from any fight in the game. It's an on-rails turret section where you're being chased by the supposedly advanced tank and have to gun it down. I've always found this to be the easiest boss in the game. You have giant glowing weak points to shoot at the front of the tank and occasionally have to shoot a targeting system that pops up. The targeting computer takes forever to actually lock onto you and when you damage it, it damages the tank's health bar. As the fight progresses, the tank will shoot missiles out of nowhere and release TikTok drones? The government is so cheap that we're buying Chinese dollar store drones now. In fact, this whole tank feels like a Chinese bootleg. Flashing lights everywhere, fragile as a starving toddler, using drones that transmit all footage automatically to their spyware app. Are we buying weapons from China now? Is this how far we've fallen? Hank has finally had enough of the cheap Chinese bullshit and enters manual mode, one-shotting our Humvee and knocking my conscious back into Frank's brain. I try to sneak away, leaving my cursed fiancé to the hands of the government, but I'm too slow and held at cannon point by Hank. He begins some kind of Metal Gear Solid monologue about targets and the battlefield and humanity's proficiency at destruction, blah blah blah, I don't care. I've gotten blown up dick chewed off only to painfully grow it back through PP gains, deny milkies from a sexy blonde mommy, cancelled, and lost my semen retention streak. The rage over the ordeal that I have suffered over the last few days boils my blood. Hank was too busy to realize something though. These are the nightmare zombies, and they're gonna follow me to the end of the earth. The incoming horde triggers the tank's automated defense systems and gets the cannon away from me. I take my opportunity to jump onto the tank, smacking Hank in the face and starting the final battle. Hank's boss fight is appropriately dramatic. We're both unarmed, on top of a tank, and surrounded by the nightmare zombies. It's all boiled down to this. My final challenge before I leave here and break the Christmas caper story, giving me countless fangirls to emotionally manipulate and dress up as Jesse. My Street Fighter skills once again come to my advantage. I use Guile's somersault kick on Hank after he fails to tackle me. This does a great chunk of damage to him, putting him on the defensive. I try to get that damage again, but to no avail. His block saves him from all damage, or so I had thought. I realized that his block only blocks a percentage of the incoming damage and that I'm still doing damage to him. So I continue to spam the somersault kick. Spamming the kick knocks the teeth out of his mouth and his nose out of place before I hit him with another kick that has the combined power of every single horse I've eaten in my life. This brings him down to less than a quarter of health. We both fall into the zombies and immediately jump back up to continue the fight. I feel the power of the equine pushing through my veins. I flash back to the first day. Those first zombies in the entrance plaza. I know why I couldn't jump kick and get those zombies off of me. I was saving the power from it for this very moment. <laughs> In Hank's final moments, he looks at me and seemingly regrets being a dollar store hunk cosplayer. He falls into the horde and they fall upon him. The zombies finally calm down, temporarily sated by the sacrifice I had kicked to them. The zombies seem to forget Isabella's curse and try to attack her. She screams for me, but I can't hear her. Everything I had gone through in the last few days only to end with a cursed concubine and the murder of a high-ranking military official. All I can muster is a final scream to the heavens. A scream that asks God, why didn't you make me into the horse I was all along? There is no answer. 
Just the number four in my head, and the odd feeling like I'm running out of time. It's Frank. Frank West. Remember that name, because the whole world's gonna know it in three days. Hey, I think you've got to see for yourself. This, my friend, is hell. Well, that's the end of the Nightmare Zombie Saga. We here at Come Dungeon Gaming would like to thank you all very much for watching and subscribing. Hopefully our nasty Coomer jokes and insane ramblings can keep you entertained for years to come. Here at the end of the video, I'd like to ask you a question. We have a few more Dead Rising videos planned and would like to see which one you'd prefer to see first. We have the only Dead Rising video you'll ever need, in which I walk the audience through infinity mode while throwing in smaller walkthroughs so that you can 100% the game with all of the knowledge that I've gathered throughout the years. This will be written in the same vein as this Nightmare Zombies playthrough. We have either that or another challenge run titled Can You Beat Dead Rising 2 Off the Record with an Eating Disorder? I'll let the name speak for itself as your imagination runs wild. Let us know in the comments below and vote in our community poll, which will have two more secret options on what you'd like to see next. Once again, the Come Dungeon Game thanks you all very much for watching. We also like to extend a special thank you to Stippo and the people from the Dead Rising forums who had worked on this mod tool that I have been using. Thank you all very much and have a great night.